Good evening, everyone, and thank you for making time and joining us this evening. My name is Shauna C. Baguette. I work for the American Osteopathic Association in the Department of Certifying Board Services, and I will be providing administrative assistance tonight. If you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A button, which should be located near the bottom of your screen. If you prefer, you can also text your question to 312-833-4435. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Additional questions, as well as the questions asked during the presentation, will be addressed at that time. And with that, I will turn it over to the American Osteopathic Board of Family Physicians Chair, John Dowling. Dr. Dowling. Thank you, Shaughnessy. Uh, greetings to everyone and welcome to the American uh, Osteopathic Board of Family Practice uh, webinar on our early entry initial certification. My name is John Bowling, current chair of the AOBFP. Also leading this webinar is Jessica Dangles, our certification director. We hope this session will outline our early entry initial certification and clear up some misinformation about osteopathic certification. To introduce myself a little bit, I was in private practice in Ohio before transitioning to a career as full-time faculty at the University of North Texas Health Science Center in Fort Worth. I've served as a residency director, chief of staff of a county hospital, full-time faculty member, department chair, and assistant dean for rural medical education. I've been involved in many state and national organizations and committees, not just in the osteopathic profession, but in organizations such as the National Rural Health Association, Rural Medical Educators, Society of Teachers of Family Medicine, Texas, uh, and the Rural Training Track Collaborative. I'm past president of the Rural, Texas Rural Health Association and the Texas chapter of the American College of Osteopathic Physicians. I, I tell you this because my osteopathic certification was critical in opening many doors during my career. Before I turn it over to Jessica to walk us through the process of EEIC, I would like to take a few minutes to outline the organizational makeup of the AOBFP and the osteopathic certification process. The AOBFP, the American Osteopathic Board of Family Practice, is composed of nine osteopathic physicians. All of us are certified in family practice and osteopathic manipulative therapy treatment by the AOA. We are a volunteer board we receive no salary for our work and spend many hours of our personal time assuring that AOA slash AOBFP certification is rigorous, clinically relevant, and affordable. All the board members are currently in active clinical practice and or involved in medical education. Our structure is quite different from the ABFM or the American Board of Family Medicine in that the ABFM has many full-time paid members of their board. Osteopathic certification is granted by the AOA. The Bureau of Specialists, BOS, which oversees the certification, is a Bureau of the American Osteopathic Association and reports to the American Osteopathic Association's Board of Trustees. Each individual specialty certification board reports to the BOS. All of AOBFP's decisions on policy and procedures for our certification must be approved by the BOS. This is quite different from the ABM ABFM system of governments and often results in misinformation and misunderstandings. Another source of misinformation is that osteopathic specialty colleges have some jurisdiction over AOA certification. 
while we, the AOBFP, have a close relationship with our specialty college, ACOFP, they have no direct role in the certification process. This is also a little different from ABFM and AAFP. The AOBFP, the American Osteopathic Board of Family Practice, does not set educational standards for resident education. And the ACOFP, the Specialty College, does not set standards for certification. So for you program directors and residents that are on the call tonight, um, all inquiries regarding certification should be addressed to the AOBFP and all inquiries regarding residency requirements and policies should be directed to ACOFP. Misinformation floats around about bias against AOA certification. Students and residents often ask, is AOA certification equal to ABMS certification? Or will ABMS certification open more opportunities for me than AOA certification? The AOA certification is one of two physician certifying bodies recognized by the US Department of Education, the other being ABMS. All the members of our AOBFP board are, as I indicated, certified in family practice in osteopathic manipulative treatment by the AOA. Some of the positions that they currently hold or have held in the past include a member of the American Board of Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine, National Medical Director, Policy and Operations and Senior Medical Director for Florida for Optimum Complex Care Management, Family Medicine Program Director, Vice Chair of the ACGME Family Practice Residency Review Committee, a consultant for Medicare, Osteopathic Representation to Peer Review Corporation Board, panel member for Medicare Advisory Panel for CMS, Dean or Associate Dean, President of State Associations, Department Chairs, and many others. I share this to demonstrate that certification is the standard, not whether it's through the ABMS or AOA. AOA certification in family medicine allows the diplomat to also be certified in osteopathic manipulative treatment, an important designation for credentialing and reimbursement. In 2013, the osteopathic profession, the AOA instituted OCC, or Osteopathic Continuous Certification, which is analogous to MOC, Maintenance of Certification. These processes have replaced the recertification every nine or 10 years. Both systems have evolved since their inception and we are continually exploring ways to improve the process. We have also looked at ways to improve our initial certification process. The early entry initial certification, EEIC, is one of our initiatives. Now I will turn it over to Jessica to explain our EEIC, and after her presentation, we will answer questions. Jessica? Thank you, Dr. Bowling. My name is Jessica Dangles, and I am the Certification Director for the American Osteopathic Board of Family Physicians. And I'll be speaking to you tonight about the benefits and eligibility surrounding the early entry initial certification. So to start things off, I have a poll that I'm going to put on the screen for everyone. And the question is, how familiar, how familiar are you with the EEIC? Very, somewhat, or not at all. So I'll give everyone just a moment to fill out this poll. Okay, and can we show the poll results?
Well, I think it's great that we're doing tonight's presentation. I see 41% of our audience is not familiar at all with the EEIC and about half of you are just somewhat familiar. So I look forward to sharing information with everyone here tonight. So to begin, I just want to give a brief overview of the American Osteopathic Board of Family Physicians or AOBFP going forward. The AOBFP has 14,000 active diplomates, and we offer primary certification in family medicine and family medicine and osteopathic manipulative treatment, or OMT. We also offer a subspecialty in geriatrics and certificates of added qualifications for CAQs in addiction medicine, correctional medicine, hospice and palliative care medicine, pain medicine, sleep medicine, sports medicine, and undersea and hyperbaric medicine. Now I'd like to go into more detail about the EEIC. An osteopathic family medicine resident that's currently enrolled in an AOA approved or ACG ME accredited program may be eligible for the EEIC exam. An osteopathic resident that's completed two AOBFP in-service exams now that's the ISE or ISE plus out of their three yearly in-service exam requirement is eligible for the EEIC. Now at the time of application, residents will be required to submit proof of taking two ISE or ISE plus examinations. At the time of application, a resident will download a form that will provide their program director I will sign off on indicating that they've completed two of these AOBFP in-service examinations. Now let's talk about some of the benefits of the early entry initial certification exam. So this exam is taken earlier in residency when skills are fresh. Compared to the traditional, traditional certification exam that has 400 items, the EEIC has half the questions with 200 sport items on the exam. And additionally, there is a lower cost to the exam. The exam fee is $400 compared to the traditional certification exam of $500. And we're hearing a lot, of, a lot of positive feedback from residents. We offered the exam for the first time in March of 2020. We had over 300 candidates take the exam and we heard a lot of positive feedback about the shorter exam as well as the reduced examination fee. Now, I'll, I'll go over some important dates later in my presentation, but applications for the January 2021 early entry exam are live on our website. Now, something else to take note of is that residents also have the option to take the OMT performance exam in the spring of their final year of residency. So now by the end of their residency in June, all residents would have completed all certification requirements by the time they complete their residency and they will be board certified as soon as the AOA receives their training complete information. Now this slide goes over the different pathways for initial certification. First, you'll see the early entry where residents can obtain certification in family medicine by completing their written examination. Now that's the examination with the 200 questions and they can also take the OMT performance exam. So you'll see they can be certified in family medicine or family medicine and OMT. Now you'll also see our traditional certification examination on here. Now remember the traditional examination has 400 items. And if you're asking, you know, why would someone take the traditional examination? Well, let's say a resident has not met the in-service examination requirement. So if they haven't taken at least two ISE or ISE plus, they can still obtain certification through the AOBFP, but they would take the traditional examination. Or let's say they've been out of the residency for a few years. Now board eligibility starts as soon as a resident finishes their program and they have six years of board eligibility. So if they decided not to pursue board, board certification while in residency, they can also still obtain board certification through the AOBFP. And once again, they can obtain certification in family medicine or family medicine and OMT. Now, with either pathway, if a physician chooses not to get certified in OMT and only pursue certification in family medicine, they can come back at any time 
and take and pass that OMT performance examination to obtain certification in family medicine and OMT. But it's always an option. Examination dates for 2021 are now live, as are the applications for the early entry examination. The early entry examination will be offered January 16th through the 30th of 2021. As I said earlier, the applications are now live on our website, and we encourage all applicants to apply by October 31st of 2020 to avoid any late fees. The final deadline for early entry is December 15th of 2020, and at that time, a $100 late fee will apply. Now, when a resident goes in to apply, they'll be asked to supply payment at the time of application, and there will be a form they need to download and give to their program director to sign off on completion of two of those in-service examinations. Now, our next scheduled OMT performance examination is currently scheduled for March 18th through the 21st of 2021. That exam is held in conjunction with the ACOP Spring Conference. We also hold the exam in the fall in conjunction with COVID. Now we are mindful of any travel restrictions that may take place in the Spring 2021 administration, and we are working closely with the college to determine if any exam postponement would take place. And we also have the traditional certification exam, which is April 5th to 18th of 2021. I would encourage everyone to monitor our website for future examination dates, or if you're interested in pursuing a certification in a CAQ or subspecialty once you've obtained your primary certification. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Bowling for some final remarks on certification. I don't want to take yourself off of mute, Dr. Bowling. That way we can all hear your final thank you. remarks. Thank you. Thank you. In summary, uh, certification is essentially mandatory in our current credentialing and employment environment. For residents on this webinar, you can take either the AOBFP or the ABFM or both in service exams. As we explained, you must take the osteopathic in cervix exam, the ISE or ISE plus, in order to qualify for AOBFP early entry. For you program directors that are uh, on the call tonight, we hope that you will discuss all options and dispel any misinformation and provide your residents the pathway of their choice. Our EEIC has been developed to facilitate the certification process and the entry into OCC. We are continuing to work with the AOA to develop specific OCC requirements and OCC costs for those who choose EEIC. Whether you come in through the traditional or the EEIC, you are still eligible to uh, jump into OCC. We're hoping that the EEIC, the early entry, will provide some advantages and uh, speed up your uh, pathway to become certified. So thank you and uh, I'll turn it back to Jessica to monitor questions. Yes, we'll take questions from Shaughnessy and if you do have questions, if you're already board certified and you have questions regarding your account or your OCC, we do have our email address on there. So if you want to send us an email, if you have questions about your specific board certification, you can certainly look into that. But Shaughnessy, looking forward to a QA. and a And Shaughnessy, we've got you on mute as well. <laughs> Thank you to Jessica and Dr. Bowling, it was a, a very informative webinar. However, we do have some questions. And the first uh, question up is, does the written test for the family medicine exam have the exact same questions as the written test for the family medicine OMT written exam? So there's not a written OMT exam. The question might be, are the questions the same for the traditional? exam versus the early entry. 
And I can speak to that and I can say that they both follow the same test blueprint. So the table of specifications or test blueprint would not change in terms of the content categories or percentages of items on the exam. In terms of a written OMT exam, that's not something that's currently in place. So the OMT exam involves answering questions on site for a case that's presented to you and then doing a hands-on demonstration. But there isn't a full-on written exam to do for OMT. And this is Jeannie James, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Certified Board Services. And just to piggyback on what Jessica shared, there might be some confusion. The, the written exam is the same whether or not you are choosing to also get certified in OMT. So the cognitive piece is the same. What, va what the variation is that with OMT, you take the hands-on practical exam. So that might add some further clarity. Correct. I think that's, yeah. that's likely what that was, yes. And, and if I could make one more comment there, there are questions on both written exams that address uh, osteopathic principles and practice content. So uh, even if you are getting certified in family practice alone, you still are going to have some questions on the written exam referable to uh, o, what we call OPP or Osteopathic Principles and Practice. The OMT certification is our performance exam, which consists of demonstrating competence in treating three cases uh, during your uh, it's an OSCE type format where you move from station to station and are evaluated. That's the, that's the test that we give for the OMT certification. Very well said, Dr. Bowling. Is Shaughnessy, could you provide us the next question? Yes, the next question is, do you have to pass the ISE or ISE plus exams or you just need to have taken them? Your program director will need to sign off that you successfully completed the examinations. We're not looking for any kind of score or any copy of exam results, nothing like that. We are looking for successfully completed to ISE or ISE plus. And remember the program director will be signing off on this for you. And, and if I may uh, expand on that a little bit, um, the in-service exams uh, were designed and are, are given for formative evaluation by the program directors. Uh, it gives the program directors a, a way to assess the progression of the resident through the residency curriculum. There's no cut score, there's no pass-fail uh, that one has to obtain. Uh, it's a formative exam. Once you take the certification exam, though, there is a cut score there. So uh, it's a, uh, as Jessica said, the program director has to sign off that the resident has taken two of the ISE, uh, the osteopathic in-service exams, uh, and completed them. But uh, it, it's a formative examination. And since we're talking about ISEs, I'll uh, jump down a little bit. We have a question that says, can you clarify the in-service exam requirements? Does it have to be osteopathic only? Yes, the in-service examination requirement to be eligible to take early entry is the AOBFP in-service exam produced and administered by the ACOFP. That's the official name, and that is the in-service exam or in-service exam plus, and that is an osteopathic in-service exam. Where is the location for the January 16th exam? Is that at a predetermined location or anywhere ProMetric is? These will, these, that, that exam will be administered with Pearson View as the testing vendor, and we are currently offering a hybrid testing model of testing centers and remote. So this exam will likely be uh, through the Pearson View on view system, which is a remote 
proffered platform. So the same security of a testing center, but the flexibility to test at home and test at any time during the provided testing window. The person view will be our provider. And how long will it take for the results of the early exam, the early entry? I'll let, I'll let Jeannie speak to, yeah, to I that. Can speak to that. Um, you know, just as uh, Jessica was speaking to the, our advancement with re remote proctoring, uh, leveraging technology to move into remote proctoring, and this not only because of the pandemic, we were already investigating that we would just accelerate it. The other thing is we're looking at how do we get our scores out? There's a lot of innovation happening in the AOA certifying board services. I joined the team last September and I have the privilege of working with Dr. Bowling and Jessica and the AOBFP board. And one of the things that has, was a concern was we had a, a resolution, if you will, that said that the diplomats candidates would receive their scores in eight weeks. Well, we have uh, instituted a scale scoring, I'm sorry, a streamlined scoring process that is going to shave three to five weeks off that process. Um, you know, we anticipate you'd have your results in two to three weeks. Thank you. The next question is, what study material should I use to study for the written exam? That's a question that we have a pretty standard answer for, and we can't recommend or endorse any study course or study materials. We do have the test blueprint available on our website, which indicates the content categories and percentages. I would encourage anyone to reach out to their specialty college or state society, but we as a certifying body cannot recommend or endorse any type of prep materials or study courses. Uh, we have a question asking if allopathic residents will be eligible to take the exams. I can take that. Uh. Um, the new uh, BOS policies that were, that were just posted in July 18 is that uh, um, um, uh, allopathic uh, students are eligible for pathway one, pathway two, meaning um, uh, just certification in family medicine is pathway one, the pathway two is certification in family medicine with OMT. Uh, they are, they are um, available and can take both eligible for both, both pathways if you're in an osteopathically recognized program. Um, if you are not in an osteopathically recognized program, then you're available, you're eligible um, only for pathway one, certification in family medicine. Thank you, Jeannie. If I could clarify something, an allopathic or an MD resident is eligible for early entry if they take two osteopathic in-service exams. And, and so the requirements there are simply to take those two exams. Now, if an allopathic resident, an MD, wants to obtain OMT certification and they're not in an osteopathic recognized program, there are additional OMT requirements that they must meet uh, to, to prepare for that. But that's, that's separated now from uh, the family practice certification so if if your if your degree is from an allopathic institution and you're in a residency and you take two osteopathic in-service exams you can sit for the early entry uh, family practice uh, exam correct me if i'm wrong but that's correct, right, Jessica? <laughs> yes, that, that, that's correct. We will be having more detailed information in terms of what that requirement would be if we have an MD that is interested in pursuing early entry certification. So our next question is, will two separate certificates be issued for a resident pursuing family medicine and OMM? 
There are concerns about delays in physicians being notified if they have passed their exam. Will a pass be given for each exam? Yes. So for example, the early entry candidates that took the exam in March of 2020, they have already been processed to receive a family medicine certificate only. And those physicians that will ultimately pursue OMT, they will receive then a family medicine certificate with OMT. So we wouldn't delay anyone receiving board certification in family medicine due to not having taken the OMT exam yet. So we'll get you certified as soon as you pass the exam and as soon as we receive your training complete information. Let me, let me just clarify something to make sure there's no misunderstanding. The certification is not in OMM. The certification is in osteopathic manipulative treatment. This is a, a skill that is uh, uh, taught and learned in medical school and on into residency. Oftentimes, the reason I emphasize this is our specialty college, neuromuscular metal, neuromusculoskeletal medicine, is, is a totally different certification, different residency, and OMM is sometimes blended and bleeds over between the two. So our certificate, if you choose to have certification in OMT, that's what the certificate will read, uh, certification in osteopathic manipulative treatment. And just one other thing, uh, because we're dealing with COVID and the pandemic, and there is a, um, obviously restraints on having the, the practical examination, uh, the hands-on in-person, um, if you pass the early entry or the high stakes initial exam, you would get your certification, say, certified in family practice, osteopathic, AOBOP, family practice. However, when you go uh, back and were able to do the practical exam, you'd get a second certificate, but it would have the initial certification date of when you, when you pass your, your e EEIC or the high stakes initial. And then it would have another state of when you pass the OMT. So you'd still have a single certificate that would show both of your certification dates on it. And, and I think that's crucial because I know everyone is worrying about, can I get certified uh, during the pandemic because I, I can't go take the practical exam? Uh, you will You will be able to get certified in family practice, which is going to give you the credentials to be hired or get credentials at a hospital or insurance, you will be certified in family practice. Uh, we don't want to jeopardize anybody's ability to move forward and be certified in OMT. So uh, when that becomes available, uh, you can jump in and take that. Remember, once you finish your residency, you are board eligible for six years. Technically, you could not have to take the certification exam, either the OMT or the cognitive, uh, for four or five years. Unfortunately, nobody's going to, most people are not going to hire you and you're not going to be able to get credentialed without the certification but board eligibility lasts for six years. So during that six years, uh, and in the case of OMT, even beyond that, we're allowing uh, diplomats to uh, come back into the OMT certification process and get certified in that at any time in the future uh, if they've met the uh, requirements. Thank you, Dr. Boring. Yes, I'm glad you touched on that because actually there were two questions that came in asking if one takes the EEIC without OMT performance exam, would they be eligible to take the OMT portion or the OMT performance exam at a later time? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Any time in the future. And uh, you also touched on this, but I'll still ask the question. It says, 
Your slide says the certification will be in FM and OMT. Will this not change to FM and OMM? So you so answered that, but I think you can Yeah, just, just to reemphasize, our certificate currently, uh, the certificate that I have on my wall is family practice in osteopathic manipulative treatment. We've never used OMM in our certification certificates. So the certificate will read osteopathic manipulative treatment. If I'm wrong, please correct me, but that's... You're correct, Dr. Bowling. Okay. <laughs> and if one was to follow the early entry route, how long does the certification last uh, versus the traditional route? There's no, there's no difference in terms of your certification length. And certificates are now on nine-year cycles. And we will be moving towards more of a longitudinal assessment moving forward, where diplomates will have an annual type requirement. And to make it, make it a little more clear, there, there isn't any difference in your certificate length whether or not you take the traditional or the early entry. Yeah, e either way, when you, when you become certified, you're now eligible uh, to uh, and, and required to maintain your certification to enter osteopathic continuous certification. And, and it's just that, continuing certification. So uh, we're moving toward uh, getting rid of the high stakes exam every eight or nine years. That will be phased out eventually. Uh, and it will be a, a longitudinal process. So it doesn't matter, uh, and, and I alluded to this in my opening remarks, we're, we're working continually on uh, OCC uh, processes that will be clinically relevant uh, and, and not time consuming. Uh, stay tuned. There will be a webinar on OCC sometime in the near future. Uh, we will put that together once we get some answers to exactly what our OCC uh, rev revised processes are going to be. Uh, and, and we look forward to sharing that with you. And just to add to what um, Dr. Bowling said, we currently have seven of our 16 specialty boards within the AOA on a format for longitudinal assessment. We've really heard uh, from you and from diplomats that we serve that they, the, we need to enhance the access and convenience of our OCC process. All of our certifying boards will be on a longitudinal platform by calendar year 2022. We're very excited about moving this forward uh, with AOBFP and have learned enough now that we don't expect some of the learning experiences we had previously. We are now pretty smooth and, and, and smooth as silk on this. So really look forward to making that available to you and working with this team. Thank you, Shaughnessy. Do we have a few more questions that we can take? Yes. Uh, can the OMT exam be taken alone without taking either of the written exams? No. So you do need to have your primary board certification in family medicine. You cannot just get certified in OMT. But maybe what uh, whoever asked that question may be alluding to, uh, you have to have primary certification in family practice but that certification could be uh, through MD. If you are already certified through ABMS, ABFM, and want to be certified in OMM with the completion of certain educational requirements and certifying that you've had the training, then you will be permitted to take our certification in OMT, but you can't just, if you're not a graduate of a COCA accredited College of Osteopathic Medicine, then you can't just take the OMT exam uh, without some additional uh, requirements. 
The next question we have is, is the blueprint for the early exam similar to that of the traditional exam so that they can use the same study material for either exam? They are identical, and I would encourage everyone to go um, to the AOBFP website. We just completed a full job task analysis, so we have updated testing blueprints for our exams. And it's the same testing blueprint for traditional as well as early entry and OCC. The same content domains, same percentages. Uh, this next question, again, I, I feel like Dr. Bowling alluded to it, but uh, please feel free to expand. It is, what are the advantages or disadvantages of osteopathic versus allopathic board certification? Well, um, first of all, osteopathic certification is the only way that you can uh, tack on the osteopathic manipulative treatment certification. Uh, that has to be through, through our certifying board. Uh, advantages, I would like to say rather disadvantages. I don't see any disadvantages to either pathway. Uh, for osteopathic students that have uh, come through the training in, in osteopathic colleges, uh, it's testing their uh, osteopathic content that they have learned and, uh, and sets us apart from the allopathic physician. So that advantage there uh, is, is uh, in, in my view, an advantage. But what I tried to say in my opening remarks is that while there are people out there that are telling residents that the osteopathic certification will put them at a disadvantage, I strongly disagree with that. And, and I don't see that's, I, I tried to point that out by the, uh, the organizations and the positions that our, our physicians have held and are holding with their osteopathic certification. Uh, so, I don't see any disadvantages. Is there still bias out there? Yes. Is there misinformation? Yes. I urge program directors to give the correct information to your residents and allow your residents to choose the certification path of their choice. And if I could just add on to that um, a bit, Dr. Bellamy, if you don't mind, what, one of the questions you're asking really is why osteopathic uh, certification? And you know, the, your, your residents chose the osteopathic field for a reason. One of the things that we're very excited about as an organization is that one out of every four medical students is, is an osteopathic physician. And so we're seeing them on the pathway. And why did they choose that? It's interesting to ask what we hear back is the whole person approach, the mind, body, spirit approach is much more um, attractive and uh, consistent with the soul of their, their intention to practice. And so I really speak to that strongly because it is our why. And the, the opportunity to consistently move from medical school into practice and into our longitudinal pathway for a, a continuous certification continues to underscore that why in a very real way and tangible for the practice uh, without making it a hurdle and understanding the osteopathic philosophy there. So I think that's a real exciting piece that your, your residents will be very interested in. They, they chose it for a reason. So let's, you know, I think it's wonderful to continue to make that offering to them. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, can the director of osteopathic education for those programs with osteopathic recognition sign off on the osteopathic residents taking the ISE exam? Versus the program director? I know the form asks for the program director, but if the program director is unable to do so, 
I think that would be fine as long as their title is indicated on the form that the residents would download and provide with their application. So this next question uh, is a little uh, on the personal side as far, or, well, very specific, I'll say. So it may need to be offered, uh, answered offline, but I'll still read it and you all can let me know one way or the, the other. It says, I am an off cycle resident with a graduation date of December, 2021, plan to take my second ISE in October of 2020 and will be a third year in December of 2021. Would that person be eligible to take the EEIC in 2021? And are there any plans to offer a second EEIC in the fall? I would say if you're in your final, I, I would say if you are in your final year of your family medicine program at the time of the examination, and you've taken two out of your three in-service exam requirements, then yes. I would say if there's any confusion about your application, I would say put that in your application or provide documentation from your program director. You will not receive your board certification until you are training complete. So if your colleagues are finishing in June and you're not finishing until several months later, you will not obtain your board certification until you are residency complete. So I would say yes, if you're in your final year and that's documented and you can provide that documentation with your application as well as your two ISC or ISC plus, then, then you would be eligible. So we've certainly encountered some applicants just this last time around that are maybe not perfectly on, on cycle. So we understand that. So to clarify, it's you have to be in your third year at the time you take the exam, not when you apply. You can apply to take the exam as long as you're going to be in the third year when you take the exam. Correct? Correct. Correct. And we, we used to say final year if you're in you know, a dual program and perhaps it is a four year program, you just need to be in that final year. Okay, next, uh, again, I think you addressed this, but no issues reiterating. Uh, if a DO resident decides to take the ABFM exam and wants to take the OMT practical, do they need to take the ALBFP cognitive exam as well to be certified in osteopathic family medicine and OMT? Y yes. And I, I think I understand the question. If they want to be certified in osteopathic, um, um, family practice and OMT, then they have to take the osteopathic cognitive exam. But as I outlined before, with appropriate additional training, an allopathic physician can take the OMT and they would be certified in family practice by ABMS, ABFM, and OMT by us. Is that, I may be giving false information. Jessica, help me out here. I would say if someone is certified in family medicine by ABFM and wants to come over and be certified by the AOA in OMT. We do have a pathway for that that has not been made quite public yet in terms of how that will work. I would say stay tuned for more information on that. That is something that's in the works. I'm excited. We have a lot of interest from allopathic residents and candidates on OMT. I would say, you know, if you have a specific situation, I would say email that to us and we can review that. I think there's um, a lot more interest than perhaps we had anticipated on, on this webinar on that. But yes, uh, we can certainly provide a certification in OMT, but I'd like to know a few more, a few more details on that. And just to make sure that you don't get tripped up, take two ISE osteopathic in-service exams and take the AOA uh, AOBFP early entry certification 
And then there's no question, you definitely would be eligible for OMT certification. Make it, make it simple. Exactly. The next question we have is, hello, can you share with us what score is needed to pass the EEIC or how the scoring works? Would you also be able to share what percentage of persons have taken the EEIC in 2020 and passed the exam? I'll defer to Jessica for those uh, statistics. In terms of the pass point, we do have information on our website in terms of how the exam is scored. We don't release a specific cut score or pass point for that. We are currently working with the ACOFP on providing a statistical analysis on pass point as well as performance on the in-service exam. And once we have that study complete, we would be able to share more information on uh, passing standard or passing uh, rates for the EEIC. But because we just had that examination, we don't have all that information available at this time. Uh, the next question, uh, again, I just want to ask these questions because they took the time to actually type them in. It says, if I take the EEIC in 2021, but in the future, I decide to take the MD family medicine boards, would I be able to do so? I would say yes, any, we currently yeah. have 1,937 uh, DOs who are dual, dual certified. Yes, the answer is. And, and we would certainly defer to ABFM for the process that that would have to be done. That would be their their answer, but yes, it's it certainly can be done. Another question we have is, is the limit on OMT certification the same as for board certification? For example, six years post-residency. Uh, yes, your, your board eligibility runs out six years after you complete your residency. You can always petition the board to re-enter the certification process. So if you have not obtained your certification within that six years, you can write a letter to the board and we can review that. So I wouldn't want to say you don't have any attempts after your board eligibility is up. So that's one of those cases. Send us an email, put it in writing, and we can review it to make sure we get the most accurate information for you. And, and I might add that that is a standardized process across all the osteopathic uh, uh, certification boards. The BOS has policy for re-entry and uh, it's very well spelled out. So uh, if a, whether it's a, an MD, DO, whoever, regards of what certification, if you're past the six years, there's a process spelled out by the Bureau of Specialists that all osteopathic certifying boards follow. So uh, one of the questions is, do you know of any advantages to dual certifications? And before I ask for a response, I'd like to also mention something that came through, a comment. It says, as someone who works on one of the credential committees for United Healthcare, I can tell everyone firsthand that there is no discrimination of one board certification over the other, AOA, or uh, ABMS, they do see them as equivalent. So, so re repeat that question now. The, the question was, do you know of any advantages to dual certification, DO and MD? I'll answer that by going back in my history at, and when I was applying to medical school and thinking about getting a dual degree. Uh, getting an MD and then going to osteopathic school. And I was advised that uh, that wouldn't be necessary. Uh, I chose osteopathic education because of what it stood for, the, the uh, whole person, the manipulation aspect. Uh, and I never have seen any reason why I would have ever wanted to uh, have both degrees. I would say the same thing is true about certification. 
uh, we do have uh, many uh, program directors and other uh, osteopathic physicians who are uh, dual certified. And that's another, uh, another uh, plaque on the wall if you, if you wanna look at it that way. Uh, some of them may say that both certifications uh, were beneficial. I think that's an individual choice. Personally, uh, I, I certainly have not been uh, hampered in my career and my advancement because I, I wasn't dual certified. Thank you, Dr. Bowling. So we are doing relatively well on time. And uh, I'll, I think this last question um, will be addressed to Jeannie. Uh, we were talking about the fact that uh, the certification uh, that is given out at OMM versus OMT, and one of the participants wrote, the BOS handbook says OMM. Absolutely. And it's great timing for that question because we had a meeting with our BOS just last week to address this editorial change. Um, so go forward, the family practice certification will be osteopathic manipulative treatment, OMT. And that edit just has not been made in the BOS handbook since last Tuesday. Uh, neuromuscular medicine, uh, NMM, will continue to use OMM. And as Dr. Bowling said much more eloquently than myself, um, there is a differentiation. So this speaks, OMT speaks to more of what with the treatment that is specific to family, family practice. Thank you. We just had another question pop in and they asked, do I wait for approval before registering for the written exams? You'll apply for the examination and we will review your application and we will send you an email approval when you can go ahead and schedule your examination with Pearson View. So apply, see, uh, receive approval, and then we'll get you set up to schedule your appointment. Are you, was the question meaning approval by the program director? Were they saying, should I apply even though I don't have approval of the program director that I've taken the two exams or were they talking about approval to sit for the exam uh, given by our board? They just said approval to sit for the exam. Okay, so yeah, ap apply and then they will be notified when they're approved. And how long does the approval process take once you submit your online application? The first deadline is October 31st and the examination would not be until January. I would say you'd hear back if you apply by the first deadline by, I would say early November and you'd be able to schedule your examination at Pearson View. And you can always reach out to us with any questions we're reviewing applications as they come through. So if something comes through and is missing the documentation or doesn't look right, we'll reach out to you and, and let you know. But staff is reviewing those on a daily basis. And since we have just two minutes left, I believe, I would like to ask if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat. This is our first webinar um, in this way. And if you could let us know what you liked what we what you thought you what that didn't work for you and what we could do better we will value those comments and tailor our next presentation accordingly so appreciate you taking a second to put that into the uh, chats for us and yes thank you for everyone who uh, are putting comments in right now uh, one other question well actually there's two so we'll see if we can get them in does the eeic allow a resident to work independently part-time during residency? Say that again. Does EEIC allow a resident to work independently part-time during residency? You're, oh, talking so, about, you're talking about moonlighting, I assume, the, the term. Uh, we, don't, we don't have any jurisdiction over what the resident is or is not allowed to do during residency. That would be up to the program director, their program, 
whether or not the, the uh, resident has a full independent license. Uh, and that has no bearing on whether they are uh, scheduled for the EEIC or, or whatever. Um, going, going back to the traditional where residents took the exam in March or April uh, during their last year of residency, uh, they passed that. That really doesn't have any bearing on their license. They, they have obtained a license either through USMLE or MBOME, usually in the first year of residency. So that allows them to work independently as a physician uh, assuming that whoever they're wanting to work for uh, credentials them and, and allows it. Uh, the, the, the old term, I don't know whether it's still used or not, but moonlighting was, is very common, uh, weekends off, et cetera. Uh, most programs uh, allow, but that's entirely up to the, the residency program director, uh, whether the resident is allowed to, to do that type of activity. And uh, our, our uh, getting us out of here question will be, is there a difference in time allotted for the EEIC uh, and the traditional exam? Yes, the traditional examination is quite a bit longer. So that's the eight hour exam with the lunch break in break structure and the EEIC because it's only 200 items, that's a three and a half hour exam. So we do have that breakdown on our website, but just due to the number of questions, the, the timing of the exam is, is quite different. So thank you to everyone. These were great questions. We do have our email address on the final slide here, aobfp at osteopathic.org, and our phone number. So please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us, and thank you for spending your evening with us. Yes, thank you all for attending. It's been my pleasure to uh, bring this information to you all.